Book Four of the Iliad of Homer, rendered into English blank verse by Edward Earl of Derby. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Armenta. Argument: The breach of the truce and the first battle. The gods deliberate in council concerning the Trojan War. They agree upon the continuation of it, and Jupiter sends down Minerva to break the truce. She persuades Pandarus to aim an arrow at Menelaus, who is wounded, but cured by Machaon. In the meantime, some of the Trojan troops attack the Greeks. Agamemnon is distinguished in all the parts of a good general. He reviews the troops, and exhorts the leaders, some by praises, and others by reproofs. Nestor particularly celebrated for his military discipline. The battle joins, and great numbers are slain on both sides. The same day continues through this, as through the last book as it does also through the two following, and almost to the end of the seventh book. The scene is wholly in the field, before Troy. On golden pavement, round the board of Jove, the gods were gathered. Hebe in the midst poured the sweet nectar. They, in golden cups, each other pledged, as down they looked on Troy. Then Jove, with cutting words and taunting tone, began the wrath of Juno to provoke. Two goddesses for Menelaus fight, thou, Juno, queen of Argos, and with thee, Minerva, shield of warriors, but ye two sitting aloof, well pleased it seems, Look on, while laughter-loving Venus, at the side of Paris standing, still averts his fate, and rescues, when as now, expecting death. To warlike Menelaus we decree, of right, the victory. But consult we now, what may the issue be, if we shall light again the name of war and discord fierce, or the two sides in peace and friendship join. For me, if thus your general voice incline, let Priam's city stand, and Helen back to warlike Menelaus be restored. So spoke the god. But seated side by side, Juno and Pallas' glances interchanged, of ill portent for Troy. Pallas, indeed, sat silent, and though inly wroth with Jove, yet answered not a word. But Juno's breast could not contain her rage, and thus she spoke. What words, dread son of Saturn, dost thou speak? How wouldst thou render vain and void of fruit my weary labor and my horse's toil to stir the people, and on Priam's self and Priam's offspring bring disastrous fate? Do as thou wilt, yet not with our consent. To whom in wrath the cloud compeller thus Revengeful! How have Priam and his son so deeply injured thee, that thus thou seek'st, with unabated anger, to pursue, till thou o'erthrow, the strong-built walls of Troy? Couldst thou but force the gates, and entering in, on Priam's mangled flesh, and Priam's sons, and Trojans all, a bloody banquet make? Perchance thy fury might at length be stayed? But have thy will, 
lest this in future times twixt me and thee be cause of strife renewed yet hear my words and ponder what i say if e'er in times to come my will should be some city to destroy inhabited by men beloved of thee seek not to turn my wrath aside but yield as i do now consenting but with heart that ill consents for of all cities fair beneath the sun and starry heaven the abode of mortal men none to my soul was dear as sacred troy and priam's self and priam's warrior race for with drink offerings due and fat of lambs my altar still hath at their hands been fed such honour hath to us been ever paid to whom the stag-eyed juno thus replied three cities are there dearest to my heart argos and sparta and the ample streets of rich mycenae work on them thy will destroy them if thine anger they incur i will not interpose nor hinder thee mourn them i shall reluctant see their fall but not resist for sovereign is thy will yet should my labours not be fruitless all for i too am a god my blood is thine worthy of honour as the eldest born of deep designing saturn and thy wife thine who o'er all the immortals reign'st supreme but yield we to each other i to thee and thou to me the other gods will all by us be ruled on pallas then enjoin that to the battlefields of greece and troy she haste and so contrive that trojans first may break the treaty and the greeks assail she said the sire of gods and men complied and thus with winged words to pallas spoke go to the battlefields of greece and troy in haste and so contrive that trojans first may break the treaty and the greeks assail his words fresh impulse gave to pallas's zeal and from olympus heights in haste she sped like to a meteor that of grave portent to warring armies or to seafaring men the son of deep designing saturn sends bright flashing scattering fiery sparks around the blue-eyed goddess darted down to earth and lighted in the midst amazement held the trojan warriors and the well-grieved greeks and one to other looked and said what means this sign must fearful battle rage again or may we hope for gentle peace from jove who to mankind dispenses peace and war such was the converse greeks and trojans held pallas meanwhile amid the trojan host clad in the likeness of antenor's son laodicus a spearman stout and brave searched here and there if haply she might find the godlike pandarus lycian's son she found of noble birth and stalwart form standing encircled by his sturdy band of bucklered followers from Esepus' stream she stood behind him and addressed him thus wilt thou be ruled by me 
Lycaon's son? For durst thou but at Menelaus shoot thy winged arrow, great would be thy fame, and great thy favour with the men of Troy, and most of all with Paris. At his hand thou shalt receive rich guerdon, when he hears that warlike Menelaus, by thy shaft subdued, is laid upon the funeral pyre. Bend then thy bow at Atreus' glorious son, vowing to Phoebus, like his guardian god, the archer-king, to pay a firstling lambs an ample hecatomb, when home returned in safety to Zelia's sacred town. Thus she, and, fool, he listened to her words. Straight he encased his polished bow, his spoil, one from a mountain ibex which himself, in ambush lurking, threw the breast which he had shot true to his aim, as from behind a crag he came in sight. Prone on the rock he fell. With horns of sixteen palms his head was crowned. These deftly wrought a skilful workman's hand, and polished smooth, and tipped the ends with gold. And resting on the ground his bow, strung it anew. His faithful comrades held their shields before him, lest the sons of Greece should make their onset ere his shaft could reach the warlike Menelaus, Atreus' son. His quiver then withdrawing from its case, with care a shaft he chose, ne'er shot before, well-feathered messenger of pangs and death. The stinging arrow fitted to the string, and vowed to Phoebus, like his guardian god, the archer-king, to pay a firstling lambs an ample hecatomb, when home returned in safety to Zelia's sacred town. At once the sinew and the notch he drew, the sinew to his breast, and to the bow the iron head. Then, when the mighty bow was to a circle strained, sharp rang the horn, and loud the sinew twanged, as toward the crowd, with deadly speed, the eager arrow sprang. Nor, Menelaus, was thy safety then uncared for of the gods. Jove's daughter first, Pallas, before thee stood, and turned aside the pointed arrow, turned it so aside, as when a mother from her infant's cheek, wrapped in sweet slumbers, brushes off a fly. Its course she so directed, that it struck just where the golden clasps the belts restrained, and where the breastplate doubled, checked its force. On the close-fitting belt the arrow struck, right through the belt of curious workmanship it drove, and through the coat of mail he wore beneath, his inmost guard and best defence to check the hostile weapon's force. Yet onward still the arrow drove, and grazed the hero's flesh. Forth issued from the wound the crimson blood. As when some carrion or Meonian maid with crimson dye the ivory stains, designed to be the cheekpiece of a warrior's steed, by many a valiant horseman coveted, as in the house it lies, a monarch's boast, the horse adorning, and the horseman's pride. So, Menelaus, then thy graceful thighs and knees and ankles with thy blood were dyed. Great Agamemnon shuddered as he saw the crimson drops outwelling from the wound, shuddered the warlike Menelaus' self. 
But when not buried in his flesh he saw the barb and sinew, back his spirit came. Then, deeply groaning, Agamemnon spoke, as Menelaus by the hand he held, and with him groaned his comrades. Brother dear, I wrought thy death, when late, on compact sworn, I sent thee forth alone for Greece to fight, wounded by Trojans, who their plighted faith have trodden under foot. But not in vain our solemn covenants, and the blood of lambs, the treaty wine outpoured, and the hand plight given, wherein men place their trust. If not at once, yet soon or late, will Jove assert their claim, and heavy penalties the perjured pay with their own blood, their children's and their wives. So in my inmost soul, full well I know the day shall come, when this imperial Troy, and Priam's race, and Priam's royal self, shall in one common ruin be o'erthrown, and Saturn's son, himself high-throned Jove, who dwells in heaven, shall in their faces flash his aegis dark and dread this treacherous deed avenging this shall surely come to pass but menelaus deep will be my grief if thou shouldst perish meeting thus thy fate to thirsty argos should i then return by foul disgrace o'erwhelmed for with thy fall the greeks will mind them of their native land and as a trophy to the sons of troy the argive helen leave thy bones meanwhile shall moulder here beneath the foreign soil thy work undone and with insulting scorn some vaunting trojan leaping on the tomb of noble menelaus thus shall say on all his foes may agamemnon so his wrath accomplish who hath hither led of greeks a mighty army all in vain and bootless home with empty ships hath gone and valiant menelaus left behind Thus, when men speak, gape, earth, and hide my shame. To whom the fair-haired Menelaus thus with cheering words. Fear not thyself, nor cause the troops to fear. The arrow hath not touched a vital part. The sparkling belt hath first turned it aside. The doublet next beneath, and coat of mail, the work of armorers' hands. To whom the monarch Agamemnon thus, Dear Menelaus, may thy words be true. The leech shall tend thy wound, and spread it o'er with healing ointments to assuage the pain. He said, and to the sacred herald called haste thee talthybius summon with all speed the son of esculapius peerless leech machaean bid him hither haste to see the warlike menelaus chief of greeks who by an arrow from some practised hand trojan or lycian hath received a wound a cause of boast to them, to us of grief. He said, nor did the herald not obey, but through the brass-clad ranks of Greece he passed in search of brave Machaean. Him he found standing, by bucklered warriors bold begirt, who followed him from Trica's grassy plains. He stood beside him, and addressed him thus. 
up, son of Aesculapius! Atreus' son, the mighty monarch, summons thee to see the warlike Menelaus, chief of Greeks, who by an arrow from some practised hand, Trojan or Lycian, hath received a wound, a cause of boast to them, to us of grief. Thus he, and not unmoved Machaean heard. They, through the crowd, and through the widespread host, together took their way. But when they came where fair-haired Menelaus wounded stood, Around him in a ring the best of Greece, And in the midst the godlike chief himself. From the close-fitting belt the shaft he drew, Breaking the pointed barbs. The sparkling belt he loosened, And the doublet underneath, And coat of mail, the work of armorer's hand. But when the wound appeared in sight, where struck the stinging arrow, from the clotted blood he cleansed it, and applied with skilful hand the herbs of healing power, which Chiron, erst in friendly guise, upon his sire bestowed. While round the valiant Menelaus they were thus engaged, advanced the Trojan hosts. They donned their arms, and for the fight prepared. In Agamemnon then no trace was seen of laggard sloth, no shrinking from the fight, but full of ardor, and to the field he rushed. He left his horses and brass-mounted car, the champing horses, by Eurymedon, the son of Ptolemy, Piraeus' son, were held aloof but with repeated charge still to be near at hand when faint with toil his limbs should fail him marshalling his host himself on foot the warrior ranks arrayed with cheering words addressing whom he found with zeal preparing for the battlefield relax not valiant friends your warlike toil for jove to falsehood ne'er will give his aid and they who first regardless of their oaths have broken truce shall with their flesh themselves the vultures feed while we their city raised their wives and helpless children bear away but whom remiss and shrinking from the war he found, with keen rebuke he thus assailed. Ye wretched Greeks, your country's foul reproach, have ye no sense of shame? Why stand ye thus like timid fawns that in the race run down? Stand all bewildered, spiritless and tame, so stand ye now, nor dare to face the fight. What, will ye wait the Trojans' near approach, where on the beach beside the hoary ship our goodly ships are drawn, and see if Jove will, or you his protecting hand extend? As thus the king the serried ranks reviewed, he came where thronging round their skilful chief, Idomeneus, the warlike bands of Crete were arming for the fight. Idomeneus, of courage stubborn as the forest bore, the foremost ranks arrayed. Meriones, the rearmost squadrons had in charge. With joy the monarch Agamemnon saw, and thus, with accents bland, Idomeneus addressed. I, Dominus, above all other Greeks, in battle and elsewhere, I honour thee, and in the banquet 
where the noblest mix the ruddy wine for chiefs alone reserved though others drink their share yet by thy side thy cup like mine still new replenish stands to drink at pleasure up then to the fight and show thyself the warrior that thou art to whom the cretan king idomeneus as at the first i promised comrade true but go and stir the other long-haired greeks to speedy battle since the trojans now the truce have broken and defeat and death must wait on those who have their oaths forsworn he said and agamemnon went his way rejoicing through the crowd he passed and came where stood the ajaces them in act to arm amid a cloud of infantry he found and as a goatherd from his watch-tower crag beholds a cloud advancing o'er the sea by zephyr's breath impelled as from afar he gazes black as pitch it sweeps along o'er the dark ocean's face and with it brings a hurricane of rain he shuddering sees and drives his flock beneath the sheltering cave so thick and dark about the ajaces stirred impatient for the war the stalwart youths black masses bristling close with spear and shield well pleased the monarch agamemnon saw and thus addressed them valiant chiefs to you the leaders of the brass-clad greeks i give twere needless and unseemly no commands for well ye understand your troops to rouse to deeds of dauntless courage would to jove to pallas and apollo that such mind as is in you in all the camp were found then soon should priam's lofty city fall taken and destroyed by our victorious hands thus saying them he left and onward moved nestor the smooth-tongued pylian chief he found the troops arraying and to valiant deeds his friends encouraging stout pelagon alastor chromius hemon warlike prince and bias bold his people's sure defence in the front rank with chariot and with horse he placed the car-born warriors in the rear numerous and brave a cloud of infantry compactly massed to stem the tide of war between the two he placed the inferior troops that he and against their will they needs must fight the horsemen first he charged and bade them keep their horses well in hand nor wildly rush amid the tumult see he said that none in skill or valour overconfident advance before his comrades nor alone retire for so your lines were easier forced but ranging each beside a hostile car thrust with your spears for such the better way by men so disciplined in elder days were lofty walls and fenced towns destroyed thus he experienced in the wars of old well pleased the monarch agamemnon saw and thus addressed him would to heaven old man 
that as thy spirit, such too were thy strength and vigour of thy limbs. But now old age, the common lot of mortals, weighs thee down. Would I could see some others in thy place, and thou couldst still be numbered with the young. To whom Gerenian Nestor thus replied, Atrides, I too fain would see restored the strength I once possessed, what time I slew the godlike Eutalian, but the gods on men bestow not all their gifts at once. I then was young, and now am bowed with age, yet with the chariots can I still go forth, and age with sage advice for such the right and privilege of age. To hurl the spear belongs to younger men, who after me were born, who boast their vigour unimpaired. He said, and Agamemnon went his way, rejoicing. To Menestheus next he came, the son of Pteus, charioteer renowned, him found he circled by the Athenian bands, the raisers of the war cry. Close beside the sage Ulysses stood, around him ranged, not unrenowned, the Cephalonian troops. The sound of battle had not reached their ears, for but of late the Greek and Trojan hosts were set in motion. They expecting stood, till other Grecian columns should advance, assail the Trojans, and renew the war. Atrides saw, and thus reproachful spoke. O oh, son of Pateus, heaven-descended king, and thou too, master of all tricky arts, why lingering stand ye thus aloof, and wait for others coming. Ye should be the first the hot assault of battle to confront, for ye are first my summons to receive whene'er the honoured banquet we prepare, and well ye like to eat the savoury meat, and at your will the luscious wine-cups drain. Now stand ye here, and unconcerned would see Ten columns pass before you to the fight. To whom with stern regard Ulysses thus. What words have passed the barrier of thy lips, Atrides? How with want of warlike zeal canst thou reproach us? When the Greeks again their furious war shall waken, thou shalt see if that thou care to see, amid the ranks of Troy, the father of Telemachus, in the forefront, thy words are empty wind. Atrides saw him chafed, and smiling thus recalled his former words. Ulysses, sage, Laertes' high-born son, not overmuch I give thee blame, or orders, for I know thy mind to gentle counsels is inclined. Thy thoughts are one with mine. Then come, henceforth shall all be well, and if a hasty word have passed, may heaven regard it as unsaid. Thus saying, them he left and onward moved. The son of Tydeus, valiant Diomed, standing he found amid his warlike steeds and well-built cars. Beside him Sthenelus, the son of Capenus, Atrides saw, and thus addressed him with reproachful words, 
Alas, thou son of Tydeus, wise and bold, Why crouch with fear? Why thus appalled survey the pass of war? Not so had Tydeus crouched. His hand was ever ready from their foes to guard his comrades. So at least they say, whose eyes beheld his labours. I myself nor met him, e'er nor saw. But by report thy father was the foremost man of men. A stranger to Mycenae once he came with godlike Polynesus. Not at war, but seeking succour for the troops that lay encamped before the sacred walls of Thebes. For reinforcements earnestly they sued. The boon they asked was granted them, but Jove with unpropitious omens turned them back. Advancing on their journey, when they reached Esopus grassy plains and rushes deep, the Greeks upon a mission Tydeus sent. He went, and many Thebans there he found feasting in Eteocles' royal hall. Amid them all, a stranger and alone, he stood unterrified and challenged all to wrestle with him. And with ease o'erthrew, so mighty was the aid that Pallas gave, whereat indignant they, on his return, an ambush set of fifty chosen youths. Two were their leaders, Harmon's godlike son, Meon, and Lycophontes, warrior brave, son of Autophonus. And these two fared, but ill at Tydeus' hands he slew them all. Meon alone, obedient to the gods, he spared, and bade him bear the tidings home. Such Tydeus was, though greater in debate, his son will never rival him in arms. He said, brave Diomed in silence heard, submissive to the monarch's stern rebuke. Then answered thus the son of Capaneus, Atrides, well thou knowest the truth, that we, our fathers, far surpass. The seven-gated city Thebes we took with smaller force, beneath the wall of Mars, trusting to heavenly signs and favouring Jove, where they, by blind presumptuous folly, failed, then equal not our father's deeds with ours. To whom thus Diomed, with stern regard, Father, be silent. Hearken to my words. I blame not Agamemnon, king of men, who thus to battle stirs the well-greed Greeks. His will the glory be, if we o'ercome the valiant Trojans, and their city take. Great, too, his loss, if they o'er us prevail. Then come, let us, too, for the fight prepare. He said, and from the car leaped down in arms. Fierce rang the armor on the warrior's breast, that even the stoutest heart might quail with fear. As by the west wind driven, the ocean waves dash forward on the far resounding shore, wave upon wave, first curls the ruffled sea. With whitening crests, anon with thundering roar, it breaks upon the beach, and from the crags recoiling, flings in giant curves its head aloft and tosses high the wild sea spray column on column so the hosts of greece poured ceaseless to the war to each the chiefs their orders gave the rest in silence moved nor would ye deem that mighty mass endued with power of speech, 
so silently they moved in awe of their great captains far around flashed the bright armor they were girt withal on the other hand the trojans as the flocks that in the courtyard of some wealthy lord in countless numbers stand at milking time incessantly bleating as their lambs they hear so rose their mingled clamours through the camp for not one language nor one speech was there but many nations called from distant lands these mars inspired and those the blue-eyed maid and fear and flight and discord unappeased of blood-stained mars the sister and the friend with humble crest at first anon her head while yet she treads the earth affronts the skies the gauge of battle in the midst she threw strode through the crowd and woe to mortals wrought when to the midst they came together rushed bucklers and lances and the furious might of mail-clad warriors bossy shield on shield clattered in conflict loud the clamour rose then rose too mingled shouts and groans of men slaying and slain the earth ran red with blood as when descending from the mountain's brow two wintry torrents from their copious source pour downward to the narrow pass where meet their mingled waters in some deep ravine their weight of flood on the far mountain's side the shepherd hears the roar so loud arose the shouts and yells of those commingling hosts first mid the foremost ranks antilochus a trojan warrior echepolis slew a crested chief the Lacius noble son beneath his horsehair plumed helmet's peak the sharp spear struck deep in his forehead fixed it pierced the bone then darkness veiled his eyes and like a tower amid the press he fell him elephenor brave abantian chief son of chalcedon seizing by the feet dragged from beneath the darts in haste to strip his armor off but short-lived was the attempt for bold agenor marked him as he drew the corpse aside and with his brass-tipped spear thrust through his flank unguarded as he stooped beside his shield and slacked his limbs in death the spirit was fled but hotly o'er him raged the war of greeks and trojans fierce as wolves they fought man struggling hand to hand with man then ajax telamon a stalwart youth son of anthemion simoisius slew whose mother gave him birth on simois banks when with her parents down from ida's heights she drove her flock thence simois named nor destined he his parents to repay their early care for short his term of life by godlike ajax mighty spear subdued him to the front advancing in the breast by the right nipple ajax struck right through from front to back the brass-tipped spear was driven out through the shoulder prone in dust he fell as some tall poplar grown in marshy mead smooth-stemmed with branches tapering o'er the head 
which with the biting axe the wheelwright fells to bend the fellows of his well-built car sapless beside the river lies the tree so laid the youthful simoisius felled by godlike ajax hand at him in turn the son of priam antiphus encased in radiant armour from amid the crowd his javelin threw his mark indeed he missed but through the groin ulysses faithful friend lucas he struck in act to bear away the youthful dead down on the corpse he fell and dying of the dead relaxed his grasp fierce anger at his comrade's slaughter filled ulysses breast in burnished armour clad forward he rushed and standing near around he looked and poised on high his glittering lance beneath his aim the trojans back recoiled nor vainly flew the spear democuan a bastard son of priam met the blow he from abydos came his high-bred mares there left to pasture him ulysses filled with fury at his loved companion's death smote on the head through either temple passed the pointed spear and darkness veiled his eyes thundering he fell and loud his armour rang at this the trojan chiefs and hector's self gan to give ground the greeks with joyful shouts seized on the dead and forward urged their course from ilum's heights apollo filled with wrath looked down and to the trojans shouted loud uprouse ye valiant trojans give not way before the greeks their bodies are not stone nor iron to defy your trenchant swords and great achilles fair-haired thetis son fights not but o'er his anger broods apart so from the city called the heavenly voice the greeks meanwhile all glorious palace fired moved mid the tumult and the laggards roused then fell diores amarincius son a rugged fragment of a rock had crushed his ankle and right leg from enon came the thracian chief who hurled it pyrrhus son of imbrasus the tendons both and bones the huge mass shattered backward in the dust he fell both hands extending to his friends gasping his life away then quick up ran he who the blow had dealt and with his spear thrust through him by the navel from the wound his bowels gushed and darkness veiled his eyes but he advancing through the breast was struck above the nipple by the aetolian chief tossus and through the lungs the spear was driven tossus approached and from his breast withdrew the sturdy spear and with his sharp-edged sword across his waistband gave the mortal stroke yet could not touch his arms for all around the thracian warriors with their tufted crowns their long spears held before them him though stout and strong and valiant kept at bay perforce he yielded and thus side by side were laid the two the thracian and the epean chief and round them many a valiant soldier lay well might the deeds achieved that day 
deserve his praise, who, through that bloody field might pass, by sword or spear unwounded, by the hand of Pallas guarded from the weapon's flight. For many a Trojan, many a Greek, that day prone in the dust and side by side were laid. End of Book 4